Thank you so much, Alexander. This is a very generous introduction and uh, good to see you again after a while. Uh, and good evening to Greece and you know, everybody who's with us the, this evening. I should say that I know that right now there's a lot of anxiety in Greece about the tension with uh, Turkey, uh, understandably. I should just say that there are a lot of people in Turkey who also don't want this tension and you know, who want to have and better relations with Greece and other neighbors. But there's also a different mood in the country as well. Uh, let me try to explain how we came here a little bit. Then, you know, we can speak, speak about some specifics. Uh, when I was growing up, like in, I was in college, let's say, Turkey had a very nationalist uh, state ideology. It was in the 90s. This was before Erdogan. Before Erdogan and it was a very secular era. It's also a high time of uh, Kemalist Ara Turkish secularism. Uh, Turkey had tension with Greece over what we call the Kardak Island, a very small, like, island, uninhabited island in the Aegean Sea. Uh, and the secularists in Turkey were the establishment. Uh, they took pride in defending Turkey against enemies. They were speaking about Turkey being surrounded by enemies from four sides i mean the 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 motto was turkey is surrounded by seas from three sides and by enemies four sides and of course greece was one of those enemies there was always russia and at the time or uh, armenia in the south iran and uh, sorry syria uh, was an enemy at the time it was supporting the pkk so it was a secular nationalism uh, because people should not forget that people don't become liberal necessarily when they happen to be secular. Uh, so the history of Turkey throughout the 20th century has been shaped by secular nationalism, which I've criticized, you know, in, in many occasions. Then came in Turkey the Erdogan era. Actually, I would refrain from calling it the Erdogan era. It was the AKP era because the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, was not a one-man party in the beginning. It is today, but it wasn't. And when they came to power in 2002, they promised to change Turkey in all ways and better ways, I mean, from my point of view. Uh, they were afraid of the secularist generals and the whole secular establishment, which had overthrown elected governments, including the pro-Islamic governments, uh, their predecessors in the late 90s. So they wanted to secure themselves by clinging on the European Union uh, rope, as I call it. So by heading into the European Union, by making the necessary reforms, they would be securing democracy, electoral democracy, which was important to save themselves from uh, the military's wrath. And I think in the AKP, there were people who really believed in this liberal path. Uh, they believed in what I at the time called Islamic liberal synthesis. Uh, all of those people are now out. Uh, they are condemned as traitors, you know, by AKP propagandists. Uh, people like Abdullah Gül, uh, Ali Babacan, who's now heading a new party, an opposition party against Erdogan. Even Ahmed Davutoglu, who was with Erdogan until 2000, uh, early 2016, but he is also now the head of another opposition party. The, the th what I'm trying to say is that when AKP came to power, they wanted to change many things for the better and the EU orientation was very important. That's why they actually established good relations with Greece. On Cyprus, for the first time, they supported the reunification of the island. There was a referendum on that in the island. The Greek side said no, Turkish side said yes, but because of the Greek side, Cyprus uh, turned into what it is today, which is still a divided island. Uh, on minorities, like the Armenian minority, like the Greek minority, Turkey promised to take some steps, took some steps. So there was this liberal era uh, in the AKP's history. And I was a supporter. I mean, if you read my articles in the Hurriyet Daily News until 10, 11 years ago, uh, or 10, even eight years ago, I was supportive. But this started to change. Uh, by 2012 and after 2013, AKP took a different turn. And it came to what it is today, which is Again, nationalism, but this time it's not secular nationalism. It is a very, it's a nationalism very much mixed with themes of Islam and Ottoman history. Uh, Islam infused nationalism, if I may call it. Uh, 
And this got more and more intense. Uh, there were things on the road which made this happen. I mean, one thing was AKP consolidated power and inside the AKP, Erdogan consolidated power. So they didn't need any liberal EU criteria anymore, which they pragmatically needed. Right now, after the consolidation, Erdogan just needed to consolidate and you know, perpetuate power. So all that narrative and all the people allied with that were gradually purged. The military coup in 2016, which is indeed, I believe, affiliated with the group called Gulenists, which was a power broker for Erdogan and an ally of Erdogan in the beginning, then turned against him and then had a very intense power struggle. Uh, that made AKP much more insecure. Uh, the military coup in Egypt, people don't uh, see the connection between that. The military coup in Egypt against Mohamed Mursi in 2013 uh, evoked all the suspicions about Western designs on the region, including AKP itself. Ultimately, AKP changed dramatically. And Erdogan also began to, uh, he purged all the liberals in the media and in the party. So anybody who's, who looks like liberal, I think, is not there. There are still a few people who go, call themselves liberal and big supporters of Erdogan, but honestly, I don't give them that title. I think they are merely AKP uh, lackeys right now. Uh, the honest liberals who actually defended Erdogan when he was persecuted are now again persecuted by the new regime. And Erdogan, after 2016, built a new coalition of pure, hardcore, xenophobic, anti-Western nationalism. And who are the elements here? It is his party, the AKP, and the Nationalist Action Party, MHP, as we call it in Turkish, which has always been the hardcore defender of Turkish nationalism. Uh, very hawkish on Kurdish insurgency, PKK, uh, the terrorism of PKK, and uh, very hawkish on anything you know, that deviates from hardcore Turkish nationalism. So that party, which has always had a, like a give or take 10% votes, is a key uh, player in Erdogan's political faction. There's even a small party uh, but founded and led by Dol Perinçek, which is the founder of Turkish Maoism, who has also still very powerful links with China and Russia, and who's acting as a catalyst between Turkey and these two countries, is now a part of this coalition. Not officially, but clearly, uh, politically speaking. So the, the Erdogan of 2010 and 2020 is 100, 180% different from each other. Uh, the, the Islamic element was always there, but it was first uh, toying with some liberal ideas. It just turned into a very defensive, aggressive idea. Now, this new Turkey, which to me is a disappointment, has some foreign policy anxieties and adventures. The first one was Syria. And I don't blame them as some other people do blame in Syria because I think there was a moral case for toppling Assad in 2012 and 13. But Syria just unfolded into a horrific disaster with ISIS emerging and everything. And uh, Turkey didn't know what to do. What Turkey for a long time supported hardline jihadists without seeing the consequences. When Turkey realized that ISIS is a real threat to Turkey itself, it just retreated back to uh, its own position, old position of seeing only terrorists around and, and being worried about them. And that was ISIS, but also PKK. And there was a peace process with the PKK, which collapsed in the same year in 2016, actually even before that in late 2015. Uh, so every, every good position, the opening with Armenia, the opening with the Kurdish, everything just collapsed back. And as Erdogan grabbed the state, the state also, uh, I think, uh, co-opted him because he just, the, the usual narratives of the state became his narrative. Uh, now this nationalist mood is very much there in Turkey. A part of his propaganda, it's all about securing the 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent plus one, both that Erdogan has been receiving. One thing we should say is that Turkey, Turkey is quite authoritarian today. If you look at it from the perspective of free speech, it's, it's very, very grim. 
if you look at from a perspective of rule of law, it's quite grim. But elections are still real, at least so far. And Erdogan has been in power because he is winning elections. Uh, that makes Turkey an extremely illiberal democracy, I would not call it, because still there are elections. And he has been winning, winning these elections. Uh, and what he does is right now is to control 19 of the 20 news channels, almost all of major newspapers, by constant propaganda to sustain the voting bloc. Uh, I, I sometimes say Turkish government doesn't control ballots, but precisely because of that, it wants to control the narrative in the country, the, the old propaganda resources. Uh, and defending Turkey and making Turkey great again, as I put it, has become a key theme in this new political propaganda. Uh, a leg of this is in Syria, and that includes a very strong posture in Syria against PKK affiliated Kurdish militia. Here I should be fair to AKP that it's not mere anti-Kurdish. Turkey doesn't have a big problem with the Iraqi Kurdistan region because the Kurdish movement there, Barzani movement, is not PKK affiliated. But in Syria, the Syrian Kurdish forces, and, and there's one blind spot I think in Western media, they speak of the Kurds in the Middle East, and I will say which Kurds. In Syria, the PKK affiliated uh, Syrian Kurdish defense forces have become a concern for Turkey. So Turkey has uh, entered into Syria with its army and allied groups and tried to have a presence there, which still is there, a buffer zone, if you will. Uh, then a new element came out of Libya, Turkey supporting one part of the Syrian civil war against the other side. Uh, the UN supported, you know, uh, part of Libya against the other side. And in the meantime, Greece entered the scene because Great Greece emerged as an ally of Egypt, UAE, Israel, which from the Turkish point of view and France and Italy, you know, they all created this new axis, which Turkey sees as a threat to itself. Turkey has big anxieties about UAE, real or perceived, Turkey believes that the UAE government was somehow behind the coup. Turkey has a big problem with the Sisi regime in Egypt because of the Muslim Brotherhood, persecution of the Muslim Brotherhood there. And, and Turkey's own ally, the only ally Turkey has in this game is Qatar. And by entering into this axis, I think Greece put itself in a collusion course with Turkey. Uh, and it is going on. And right now there's a new conflict in Armenia. I mean, this morning we woke up and an Armenian plane was down. Armenia said it was by Turkey. Uh, Turkey says it, we didn't do it. I don't know what's, what, what's the exact reality that we will see. But now there's a new conflict between Azerbaijan. And here's one thing. These are all very complicated com conflicts and I will not get into all of those. I don't claim to be, uh, to be an expert on all of these ongoing conflicts in Libya and in Syria and between Azerbaijan and in the Mediterranean. But one thing I will say is that, two th things I will say. One is, I think propaganda for the base, ideological base, is still more important in Turkey than the actual policy and more aggressive than the actual policy. In other words, Turkey will, you might hear narratives in Turkey, you might see maps tweeted by Turkish politicians, pro Erdogan Turkish politicians, showing a great Turkey that will occupy Western Thrace and uh, Northern Iraq. I think that's more about domestic consumption rather than an actual policy. But there is an actual policy of defending Turkey's rights. And on the issue of the Aegean, the Aegean Sea, uh, this is not a new issue, that Turkey is concerned that the whole Aegean Sea will become a Greek Sea. How is that going to happen? Well, if uh, Greece extends its maritime borders from six miles to 12 miles, the whole Aegean will be basically Greece, uh, Greek territory, and Turkey will have nothing. Now, that is technically maybe valid, but politically, it looks unfair to not just Erdogan, but to all Turks. Uh, and therefore, I would urge the Greek government, instead of just saying, well, this is our right and we'll do it, to engage in some constructive dialogue with Turkey on how a, a bit more balanced, fair solution can be found 
which is acceptable to both sides. Uh, and, and again, there are some issues that even go beyond Erdogan. This blue uh, homeland, as I now call it, I mean, the territorial issue on the Mediterranean, is something that goes beyond Erdogan, the whole state establishment opposition parties are with him on this. And as I said, it was an, an issue in the 90s as well. The position against the PKK, PKK being a terrorist movement, is accepted all, all across the board. Yet still, the hawkish stance against arresting Kurdish politicians is not accepted by opposition parties, and the opposition parties are right there. What I would say is that Turkey is having a very intense national, nationalist moment. You have a new elite which captured power after a century, and they have the excitement and the euphoria and the corruption and the zeal of that. They think now it's their moment, and now they, with being tough and everything and so on and so forth, they will change the world and make Turkey a superpower again, which is unlikely to happen because there are hard facts on the ground. The economy is going down. Turkey is losing a lot of its power just because of brain drain, economic downturn, because of all the tensions in the country and all that. But this is a nationalist moment, which should be managed wisely, which should not be further provoked, which should not be escalated, but de-escalated. Therefore, I would urge, uh, I mean, I urge my fellow Turks to be less nationalist and a bit more reasonable on the Turkish side. That is the same uh, advice I would make uh, to Greek liberals uh, that, you know, let's avoid a bigger escalation between Turkey and Greece. Uh, there are signs that actually now a dialogue might take place, which is good. Uh, that's something we should support. And if you listen to nationalism on both sides, you might say, oh my God, this is just a collusion course. Uh, but they're not the only uh, actors in the field. And their uh, narrative uh, might not be, you know, their narrative is dangerous, but they might not be the only thing that we should be caring about. And we should try to tone down, I think, that conflict. I think that's true for the conflict right now between Armenia and Azerbaijan, by the way, because, which is fundamentally caused by the fact that Azerbaijani territory is occupied by Armenia since 1992. Uh, and in, in, with regards to Greece, I would love to see Greece and Turkey drilling together <laughs> uh, the Mediterranean, which would not be impossible. One thing about Erdogan is that it should be clear that I'm not a big fan of uh, his political style and uh, the, the point which he brought to Turkey. But at the end of the day, he might have pragmatic takes and turns. And I think if Greece and its allies, that includes France, that includes Egypt, uh, that includes uh, other you know, countries who are involved in the uh, energy deal, if they take positions where Turkey is offered a share rather than Turkey is excluded, I think Erdogan and his party have still uh, the nerve to take some pragmatic steps. So this is all I can say for the beginning, but I would love to hear more from you and answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mustafa, for this uh, very interesting presentation. You know, it's not very often that we can get to even listen